The one thing I believe in this world is there exists another world that basically most of the time we can never perceive it or hear it. We can't see it or smell it, but it's there and it manifests itself in different ways, in weird ways that most of the time people just, they just dismiss it because they, they see something that's fucked up and it twists their minds so much that they just kind of like bury it in their subconscious minds. They just let it go. They dismiss it. And that's the true tragedy to me in this life is when people see something amazing and then they just let it fade. And a lot of the reasons why I think they let it fade is because they don't want to be driven insane by it. But there's people such as myself that when supernatural elements happen, that we, instead of letting it go, we embrace it. You know what I mean? You could call those people many things. You know, some people say they're like ghost hunters or, you know, some people call them psychics or whatever it is. But those people are more attuned to the supernatural world. They're more evolved into it. And instead of closing their eyes, which 99.9% .9 of the population do, they open their eyes and they realize that there is another world, that there are supernatural elements, that there are even horrors of this world. So anyway, there is a supernatural world that I've come to know. And I know that it exists because I've seen it many times in my life. I've seen situations happen and I've listened to other people's stories. You know, stories that are so profound that there's no way that they could just be made up, like be fiction or part of someone's vivid imagination. There exists a world outside of this one, and I've seen it. I've seen both sides of it. I've seen the demons, and I've seen and been privy to the angels as well. <laughs> Joe the Gray Wizard. This one time there was a friend of mine. His name was Joe the Gray Wizard. Now Joe wasn't really a wizard per se. He was more of a warlock because he practiced the Wiccan belief. And what he was most known for amongst our crew was empowering stones. He could basically take any kind of stone and bestow it with luck or protection or love and then you would gain that benefit along those lines as long as you held those stones in your possession and that's basically what joe the gray wizard was known for now this one incident happened uh that i'll never forget and again it was one of those things that you know people would probably dismiss uh, you know at some point like if they seen it you know they might be astonished by it at first, but then as time went on, they would probably just dismiss it out of their mind. But I'll, I'll never forget this moment. And, you know, like retelling it, it might not sound that fantastical, but it was, it, it really did amaze me when it happened. When it happened, when it happened, when it happened, when it happened. All right, we used to go to uh, Chicago uh, once a year to this uh, this arcade. It was a virtual reality arcade called the Battletech Simulator. And now like, you know, I'd go down there with a group of my friends and we'd usually spend a weekend down there. Now anybody that's ever been to Chicago, they know that it's incredibly windy. Like, you know, um, at certain parts of the year, you know, they don't call it the Windy City for nothing. And this particular time was in winter time. And uh, where we parked our car was like about quarter mile away from where this arcade was because it was in the middle of the downtown area. You know, it was the parking was always for shit. Anyway, we parked our car and we walked to the virtual reality arcade. And as we're walking, there's this incredible like biting wind. It was crazy cold and just like blasting you in the face, you know, and, it, and you know, there was a really strong force to it to the point where it was uncomfortable. You know what I mean? It was the kind of shit that caused your your eyes to water and then, and then they would just like freeze, you know what I mean? Because it was so fucking cold at the same time. So anyway, we go to the arcade, you know, we went to the arcade this one particular day and you know, we got our, uh, our gaming in and when we were leaving, it was nighttime, so it was even colder. 
And most of my friends were walking up front and me and Joe, the gray wizard, we were about a block behind and we were walking. And this wind was just nonstop blasting in one direction right into our faces. I looked at Joe, the gray wizard, and I said, man, I wish this fucking wind would stop, you know? And as soon as I said that, he looked over at me and he bowed his head as we were walking forward, like pushing into this wind. And he extended his hand out in a stopping motion. So here he is walking, bowing his head in deep concentration, like looking down, not, not really looking at anything because he had his eyes closed, but in deep concentration. And he was holding his hand out in front of himself, right? All of a sudden, this wind that had been blowing for hours, you know what I mean, nonstop, suddenly stopped. And not only did it stop, but all of a sudden I felt like a gentle pushing of this wind behind us. You know what I mean? The whole time it was blowing in one direction, which was like straight onto us as we were walking. And all of a sudden, the wind was like gently pushing us from the back. It was almost like the wind was wrapping itself around a shield that was in front of us and like curling into the back. You know what I mean? Like curling into the back around the shield. And I looked at Joe you know, as I was walking and I couldn't believe what was happening. And when we got back to the vehicle, I wouldn't let it go, man. I was like, Joe, how the fuck do you do that, man? You stop the fucking wind. Are you serious right now? I was like, how do you have these powers? You know what I mean? And he just looked, you know, he was all, he was a real humble dude. You know what I'm saying? He just kind of looked and smiled, you know, like he would never tell anybody anything about his magical powers or how he went about uh, changing the world. That always stuck with me, and even years later, I would ask him, you know, Joe, man, when are you gonna tell me how you stopped that fucking wind, man? This Joe the Great Wizard, I had, uh, you know, I was friends with him for, for many years, and there was another incident that happened where we were actually uh, playing a game of Morton's List. Now, Morton's List is a game that basically you roll randomly on this table and it gives you a random activity, something to do, you know, and all the activities are basically something that someone would do for fun. Anyway, we happen to roll sands. And we happen to be playing the game with Joe the Grey Wizard. You know, so we, we talked about it and we decided that we were gonna hold the sands right at Psychopathic Records, like right at the office. And Joe the Grey Wizard, who was very versed in seances would actually conduct it. So we were like, all right, cool. So we went there, we basically got all the stuff we needed. We got four candles, they were brand new candles. Um, and he, he needed a, a sheet of glass, you know, which we got. And so the glass was, he explained it, was gonna be the gateway into the spiritual realm. And so then we conducted the seance and we were trying to reach a really good friend of mine who passed away in high school. He, he actually committed suicide. His name was Kenny Veach. And this was a, a, a really good friend of mine. Like, I've tried to reach him in several different seances throughout my life. All through middle school, I hung real tight with this kid like every day, you know, without fail. Uh, and then when we went into high schools, he actually moved away and we kind of separated anyway. He committed suicide. And when they found his body, he was actually in his garage, you know, he kept the car running, you know, to kill himself. And when they found his body, he was actually in the garage with his body stretched out toward the door leading out of the garage. Like he, he, he had changed his mind last minute and he didn't want to commit suicide, but it was too late. He, he passed before he got to the door. Anyway, so we, you know, we decided we were gonna try to contact Kenny Veach, you know? Cause I always, I always felt like I never got closure, you know, with him. And so like, that was, you know, when it was brought up, who should we try to reach? You know, that's who I wanted to bring up because like, I felt like if we can somehow, you know, come in contact with him, I would like to have my final words with them. So anyway, we were conducting the seance and Joe the Great Wizard, like when he did 
seances, he would always begin it with open the gate. You know, and he explained it, seances are dangerous because when whenever you do a seance, you have to open a gate. The problem is with opening a gate is you never know who's gonna come through that gate. And he explained that the glass was a representation of that gate but it also allowed him to peer into the other side so he could see what was about to come through the gate. You know, it, it, using his, uh, his warlock abilities, he was able to perceive the spiritual realm, at least, you know, a part of the spiritual realm by use of the sheet of glass. So anyway, we were, we were holding the seance and we were trying to reach Kenny Beach and he opened the gate and you know, he, he warned us all, like before we even did it, you know, this could be something that might get fucked up. <laughs> you know what I mean? So by opening the gate, you never know what's gonna come through. So we started doing the seance. At one point we asked for a sign. And just as he asked for a sign that there was a spirits like close at hand, you know, that could assist us in finding Kenny Beach, we heard a heavy thump on the roof of the building. So we all looked up and we were like, you know, kind of like, whoa, that was fucked up, you know? We were kind of looking around at each other and we heard the thump again. So then we were like, is this fucking real? You know what I mean? No, it's probably just like something weird. Even though we didn't hear no thump at all the rest of the time. So then he asked the spirits to help us to find Kenny Beach. So he looked down and he said, can we get another sign? And as he was saying that, on the table there were those four candles. Now each candle was casting a perfect shadow because they were all brand new candles. And the shadow was like around the base of the candle and it probably extended out about two inches. Anyway, as he asked for the second sign, all of a sudden, one of the shadows on the candle begins expanding across the table <laughs> and we were like I, I think i was the first one to notice it i was like whoa look at that shadow and it was just creeping growing then it was three inches then it was four inches all of a sudden it was about like seven or eight inches expanding across the table as if it was like uh I, I don't even fucking know how to explain it but it was one of those things where it just flipped your mind like you're looking at it and you're not even, it's, your mind is having a hard time processing what you're seeing because it's something that's just, it's breaking the rules of this world. Like it's just not, it's not supposed to be happening. So as it dawned upon everyone, what was going on as the shadow was expanding across the table, all of a sudden, Joel the Grey Wizard he looked out at the mirror and we looked over at him and you just see this look of complete terror on his face. Just complete and utter terror. And then he said, close the gate, close the gate, close the gate. Like he screamed it out. And then we're like, all of a sudden, boom, the shadow went back to normal. The thumping on the roof stopped. And we're all looking around like, what the fuck happened, man? Like, what, what's going on, you know? And Joe said that he's seen some sort of demonic form that was coming through the glass and he said that it was wolf-like in nature the way he described it was it, it was it was a wolf type demonic creature that was trying to break its way up through the glass to get out into our world and he was able to at the last minute he was able to close the gate to keep it from entering our world. Part of the reason that I wanted to tell you the wind story is because I want you to know that Joe, the great wizard, he was not prone to like bullshit stories or, you know, he wasn't into the displays of his abilities or his powers. So I never questioned his abilities and like his stones that he gave out and that he empowered. Like I always, took them as if they were gold you know what i mean because i knew that in some way somehow he was able to actually utilize real and true magic 
you know, to affect, you know what I mean? To affect this world, 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 world. The woman of my dreams. This next story that I want to tell you all is about a ghost or something, an entity that has been haunting me my entire life. It has cropped up throughout my life starting from when I was a young boy until right now. It's always been a mystery to me whether it's actually a ghost or a haunt, you know, some spiritual entity that has been like within me and like around me throughout my life for some reason, or if somehow it's someone that used to be in a past life, and the past life, like the memory of that life, even though the memory of your past lives are all suppressed in the back of your head, and back of your mind, it was so strong, the memories of this person were so strong, that somehow those memories are somehow filtering through from my subconscious mind into my conscious mind at various moments throughout my life so that it appears that it's a ghost. But whatever the situation is, this thing, this entity, this person, if you will, has been haunting me my entire life. Now it started when I was about six or seven, or maybe a little bit younger than that. And from that early age, like there, there isn't too many things that I can actually remember. But I remember there were nights, there was like many nights that as I laid in bed trying to go to sleep, I would hear a woman calling my name. And it would usually take place like right as I was about to go to sleep. Like, you know, still awake, not totally awake. But then I would hear this female voice call my name and it would just say, Rob. Right? And it would be real close, as if there was a woman hovering over my bed, even though there was nothing there. And she would say my name. Rob. And then I would freak the fuck out, of course. Even you know, as a little kid, I was like, what the fuck? I'd usually hide under the covers. I would scream for my mom, ma, ma. And then my mom would be like, go to bed. You know? She would get annoyed because it was happening so much. So this voice haunted me for probably about a year. You know, it wasn't every night. I'm not even sure how often it happened, but I just know it was many times. Like, like you know, like it might have been like, you know, once a week or it might have been two times a week. But it was always the same female voice calling out my name. Rob. And I had no idea why. After about a year, the voice finally went away. Like it just... It just totally went away and years passed and in some respects I even forgot about it like you know like I wasn't really thinking about it or dwelling upon it too much you know maybe it was just my childhood imagination type thing fast forward through the years I was probably about maybe nine or ten years old when I had this dream now in this dream it might not be exactly a dream it was more like a vision or, or not, not a vision but it was more like a scene in a dream, okay? Cause all of a sudden, boom, I found myself inside this van, okay? And the van is turned up on its side and the whole front windshield is shattered, okay? It's all spidered, you know, and there's fucking glass all in the van. Now I'm in the driver's seat because the van is actually up on its right side. As if, as if it had been involved in this huge accident. I'm in the driver's seat because, you know, the steering wheel's right in front of me, and I'm looking around, and I look down, right, toward the passenger seat, and inside the passenger seat is this woman. Now, she's, it's a white woman. She's got black hair, 
and her face is completely smashed in. Horrific. It's all bloody. There's fucking glass everywhere. And she's looking up at me and she's saying something. Now, when I woke up from this dream, I woke up and it was just like I was in a cold sweat and my heart was racing and I was just super fucking panicked. You know what I mean? It took me probably about a couple hours to actually like calm down. That dream was so powerful that I never forgot it. There was a significance to it, a weight to it that was just all powerful. Fast forward through a couple more years. I found this cat in my neighborhood. You know, it was kind of like a, a, a stray cat, a dingy gray cat. And, um, you know, it was probably like an adult, it was an adult cat. So I snuck the cat into my house and I had it in my bedroom. You know, I was, I was like, you know, petting the cat and everything. And, you know, I was kind of unwinding about to go to sleep. And the cat was laying at the end of my bed, right? So all of a sudden I hear the cat hissing. And I, I look up and I'm like, whoa, what, you know, what the fuck, man? And it's hissing at the end of the bed. And when I looked up, the light from the street, you know, the street light is coming through my window and reflecting off its eyes, you know what I mean? So its eyes are like, you know, glowing. And its, its back is arched and it's hissing for no reason, you know, at least none that I could see at the time. And I freaked out and I panicked. And believe me, like, I, you know, I love animals to death, but when I looked up and that thing was all arched and hissing and, and with the glowing eyes, I kind of kicked it, you know? Not really kicked it, but my feet were under the covers and I just kind of like, I flung my feet up so it would, it propelled the cat off the bed, you know? So the cat flung in the middle of the room and it scattered. As soon as it hit, it was like, did this quick little hiss and it scattered and disappeared in the room. So I'm like looking, what the fuck, where'd it go? You know, but it's all dark in the room, you know, some light coming through, but I can't tell where it is. And so I stopped and I tried to listen and like hear for it. You know, and my heart was racing and you know what I mean? I was kind of like terrified because I didn't know if that cat was crazy or what. If it was like a rabied animal or what was going on. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, that's when I heard the woman say my name again. Rob. And it was out of nowhere, and it was close, as if she was like right above my bed. Just like when I was a kid all those years ago. Like I had even kind of like forgotten about it. But when it happened, there was a familiarity to it. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I knew this woman, you know what I mean? But at the same time, she terrified me because it was just like this disembodied voice just floating in the room. And when I heard her say my name, I fucking panicked. I ran out the room. I was like, Joe, Joe, Joe. You know, I got my brother up. Joe, there's someone in my room, you know? We ran back in the room, turned on the lights. We started flipping over beds and shit. Like we're like looking all around, you know what I mean? Trying to find out, you know, what was going on. And we found the cat and let the cat out, but that was it. You know, I didn't hear the name, nothing. You know, the, the whole rest of the time, right? You know, so, you know, eventually I was able to get back to sleep probably like, you know, near the morning time because I was so worked up, you know, it freaked me out like really hard. And I started remembering you know, when I was a kid, you know what I mean? Some years pass and, and I joined the army, you know, so I go through basic training and then you got your advanced individual training or AIT, right? So I made it through basic training and all that. Now in AIT, we're in this giant day room. It's like, it's got like, it's all bunk beds with uh, stand up wall lockers next to them. Okay, and there's probably about like 50 people in the room. Now my friend is sitting on the bed, so I'm getting everything ready and I'm talking to him. And I'm talking to him normal, you know what I mean? Like, just, you know, having a normal conversation with the guy, you know? And, you know, I'm standing up. All of a sudden, like I'm looking at him and I'm in mid-conversation with him. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I have this incredible vision, and it's the only time in my whole life 
where I've actually had a vision of something. It was a straight up super powerful vision and all of a sudden I was there. I was in the van, the same van of my dreams, right? The van was on its right side. The van had been in this terrible accident. The front windshield was all smashed up. It was daytime. Everything's all bent and twisted out of shape. Um, I'm in the driver's seat and I must have had my seatbelt down because I'm not falling even though it's on its right side. So I had to have been strapped in. And I looked down at this woman who I know without a shadow of a doubt I love. It's killing me to look at her with her whole face smashed in, all bloody. You know what I'm saying? She's got black hair, white woman. You know, she's probably like, I, I couldn't really t tell you how old she was, but I, I want to say she's maybe like young adult. And she's looking up at me from the passenger seat and I see this terror, almost like a sadness in her eyes. And the amount of emotions are flooding through me. And she looks up at me and she's saying something to me. And as she's saying something to me, I can now see what she's saying. In the dream, I couldn't really see it. But here in this vision, I can clearly see what she's saying. And even though I can't hear it, I know what she's saying because I've seen it on people's lips a million times. She's saying my name. She's looking up at me and she's saying, Rob, you know what I mean? Like in a state of like shock. So all of a sudden, bam, I'm out of the vision. I'm standing in the day room and there's tears running down my eyes. And you know, the guy I was talking to, like my friend, he's, he's just looking at me like, what's going on, what's wrong? You know what I mean? And I can only imagine what he was seeing because like I was just talking to him all normal like and I probably just blanked out and all of a sudden these tears are coming down my eyes. I don't even know, know how long I was out. And he's just like trying to shake me like what's going on? So nothing man, I, I was like nothing, nothing. I just ran out the room. Now as soon as I got out, I fucking, the only thing I remember is I sat down and I sat there for a while. You know, in, in order for my adrenaline and, and the flow and everything just to really come down and for everything to even out, you know, it probably took about three hours. Now as the days pass, I wonder when she'll return. I wonder if it will be as I drift off to sleep in a vision or even in some twisted wrecked van along the highway. I know she was always close to me, haunting me for some reason, for some purpose. Whether she's a ghost of forgotten memories or a future event that is still yet to happen, it remains one of the greatest mysteries of my life and one that I'm not so sure that I want to know the answer to. The answer to. The answer to. White Haven Sanatorium. So back in the day when ICP was signed to Jive Records, we used to take many trips back and forth to New York and we would drive all the time. And it was it was always pretty much it was like me, Joe and Joey, and Alex Abbas. Like and we used to take these business trips out to New York, uh, you know, just to discuss like music videos and stuff like that. So these drives along Highway 80 were pretty boring, especially when you pass through Pennsylvania because it was all woods and like mountains and there really wasn't much to see, uh, you know, besides the beauty of nature. So anyway, one of the times when we were coming back from New York, uh, you know, we were passing through the, the eastern part of Pennsylvania and we were noticing all these like big ass fucking mountains, you know? 
Uh, they, they don't look like your traditional mountain, you know, with all rocks and with ice on the top. But they're, they're these huge, like, mountains covered in trees. They, the only way to correctly describe it is like a gigantic hill, you know what I mean, uh, that went up like crazy high. And uh, so we decided, like, I came up with the idea, like, just to break up the monotony of the drive. Hey, let's climb one of those mountains. You know, and uh, as soon as I said it, everybody was like, all right, hell yeah, let's let's do it, you know? So I was like, all right, the next big-ass fucking mountain we see, we're going to pull over and climb that bitch. So sure enough, we came around the bend, and there it was, this humongous-ass fucking mountain. It was just going high up into the sky, you know? And this was in the middle of the day, and it just looked awesome, you know? And we were like, all right, fucking test of the ninja. We got to climb that bitch. So we pulled the car as close to the mountain as we could actually get. And, uh, and then we got out and we started just cutting through the woods, you know, and it was deep ass woods and the grade just went straight the fuck up. Now, the first thing we came across when we were climbing up this mountain was an old crumbling stone wall, you know, and this wall basically went to the left and the right as far as we could see and, and surrounded the apex of this mountain, okay? Uh, so the wall was pretty huge and it wasn't it wasn't that tall. It probably stood about four feet tall So we started walking along the wall uh, Just to try to find a way to get into it, you know to get past the wall without having to climb over it And that's when we seen the sign and the sign said uh, it was all it could, you could barely read it because it was all like just kind of faded through time and you know, and it was like there was all these vines overgrowing on it. So we actually had to clear it a little bit away from the, from the overgrowth just to read it. But it was the White Haven Sanatorium. We all, you know, we all started saying, whoa, what the fuck is that? You know what I mean? Like, what the hell is a sanatorium, you know? So we were like, okay, so, we, you know, it was a little bit of a mystery there. Anyway, we finally found an opening uh, through the wall. We went in and we kept climbing up and further and further and further. I mean, it probably took us about an hour uh, to get through the undergrowth and all that, get to the top. Now, the first thing we noticed was a building. It looked like a huge, ancient, rundown, abandoned facility that had, uh, it had probably about six to eight large, three-story tall buildings that looked like, uh, they looked like hospitals. I mean, that's the only way to describe it, like, uh, but not any hospital that I've ever seen or we've ever seen. It was basically hospitals from like the 1940s or something. They looked very uh, stark, without character, like just uh, straight boxes, you know. Uh, they were L-shaped and they had many, many windows on the sides. And there was like these, uh, these giant uh, white steps that went up in this kind of grandiose way with these giant pillars on either side of them that you would enter into these buildings. And so we looked around and we realized, I mean, for lack of a better term, it was a ghost town. Like, completely abandoned. Uh, altogether, there, there must have been at least 20 buildings, you know, including like the houses and the giant, giant hospital type buildings. There was a, a, an abandoned church in the middle of everything. There was uh, some other buildings that, you know, were completely abandoned. That it was hard to tell what they were. Uh, so we started to explore these buildings. Now, the first thing, we, when we went into the one of the hospital buildings, um, it, there was just this feeling of foreboding over the whole place like it, it it just like it just had you on edge like everybody was like kind of scared as they walked around the hairs were rising on your arms you know and uh you just felt uncomfortable like something wasn't quite right here you know even in the you know it was broad daylight and everything and it was just like still there was this like feeling of of dread now exploring through the building one of the things that I noticed that, uh, that I think is worth noting is the fact that there was very little graffiti anywhere in the building. It's like not only was this place abandoned, but nobody, none of the locals, they, no, nobody went there. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was like a place that uh, probably the locals realized was like, you know, you know, stay the fuck away from that place. You know, you don't ever want to go there. So, so anyway, uh, we explored all, a couple of these buildings 
and the unease as we were exploring them intensified. Uh, some of the rooms, there was like, they were filled from floor to ceiling with furniture that was just all thrown in there, like broken chairs and fucking filing cabinets and shit all piled up. And uh, dust was everywhere. Most of the windows were broken. So finally, we got to the roof of one of the hospital buildings. And I looked at my brother. And as we stood on top of the roof and we could overlook like the whole forest, like we were on top of the mountain, on top of this three story tall building, overlooking this like relatively beautiful landscape of just rolling hills and mountains and trees. And uh, whenever me and my brother would get into a situation like this and, and Joey, uh, it's something we started when we were little kids, you know, we would, we would yell out, All three <laughs> you know, just as, as a show of like triumphing something like we, 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 we beat it, you know what I'm saying? We conquered it. We came, we explored, uh, you know, we beat it. So we, we, we all screamed that out at the top of our lungs, you know, and it just echoed through the hills. And as soon as we did that, we noticed all of a sudden these hunters came out of the trees, like, you know what I mean? Like real far away, like hundreds of yards, but they came out of the trees with their rifles and they were kind of looking up at us. And we were like, oh, shit, you know, we fucking, we probably uh, ruined it for them, you know, spooked all their game or whatever. We were like, let's get the fuck out of here, you know. We all got all amped up and shit, and we started, like, running through the building, and, you know, we wanted to get out of there before we got killed by some 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 hunter, like, deliverance style or something. So we fucking just kept running, and we ran down the side of the hill, and, you know, and uh, basically we, we made our escape. So anyway, um... Like, we went back home, and I started to do research on the Whitehaven Sanatorium. Now, what I came up with uh, researching it on the internet is that it was basically built in 1901. And from 1901 to uh, 1956, it served as a sanatorium. And basically what a, a sanatorium is, is a place for patients with tuberculosis to go to isolate them. And for most of them, they would die there. Tuberculosis was like a, uh, it's basically a disease that attacks the lungs and it's easily spread through like coughing and, and sneezing and stuff like that. So when somebody caught the disease, they were sent to a sanatorium to basically stay until they eventually were cured. You know, they, they stopped having the signs and symptoms of it or they died. So throughout the course of its history, over 25,000 people were actually, actually went there and were isolated there, half of which died. So you think about that, how many thousands of people died right on that spot? So it occurred to me that this place is a spiritual uh, haunting ground. You know, all the ghosts, all the people that died horrible, slow deaths right on that spot. That's where they would end their lives. And some of them, it took years. They, they, they suffered for years before they died. So it really started to dawn upon me why this place was had such a dreadful uh, a feeling, like uh, how, how, why it was so intense. Now, after 1956, the place was turned into an insane asylum. Okay, now back in those days, an insane asylum, uh, the prevailing methods of treatment, uh, they emphasize segregation from society, physical containment in padded cells, restraint, and shock therapy. Basically, all the horrors that you hear about, about insane asylums back in the day, this is where this shit took place on the same fucking grounds. It's almost like the ground itself was tainted with this evil throughout the course of its whole history Anything that's ever been done there has all been revolving around death, suffering, torture, uh, just the, the, you know, uh, the worst of the human experience, you know, the worst of the mortal experience. So there's probably many, many spirits that are still dwelling upon the grounds. Now, it was at that moment where I came up with the ninja mission. Now, ninja missions to us throughout our days since early childhood was whenever you had an idea to like to explore an abandoned building or, you know, uh, sneak into a foreign country or whatever the fuck the case may be. 
uh, you would call it a ninja mission. And you, you would present it to, you know, we would present it to our crew like, man, I got this fresh ass ninja mission. We're going to do this, you know? And so my ninja mission was we were going to spend the night at the White Haven Sanatorium. Just the idea of it terrorized me. So I got together with a group of my friends, you know, and we basically, like, I pitched the idea uh, to everybody. And basically there was, uh, I got together a crew of about eight people. Now, uh, Joe and Joy weren't able to go on this particular ninja mission because they were busy with other things. But uh, Alex, uh, who used to be the president of Psychopathic, he was there and about seven of my other friends. And we loaded up in two cars and we chose the day that we were going to go, which was, which was in the, uh, the beginning of October. And we drove there. Now, when we got there, you know, we decided that uh, we were going to park the cars far enough away so that they wouldn't be bothered, like they wouldn't be like parked illegally or something, the cops would find them. So we actually parked the car in, uh, in a neighborhood in Whitehaven. Now, we had everything we needed for the ghost hunting experience. Uh, we have the Ouija board. We had writing utensils and supplies for ghost scribing. And, you know, we had cameras, voice recorders, like everything. You know, we, we like came well prepared. So we basically got to the edge of the mountain and we, we climbed it just, uh, just as the sun was setting. And we decided that no matter what, we were not going to leave those grounds until the sun came up, no matter what happened. That was the ninja mission. So when we got there, the sun had completely set. Okay, now, we decided that we were going to break up into small groups uh, that was going to be basically three, three people each and separate and start exploring the buildings. And then uh, after two hours, we were going to all meet back at the abandoned church to talk about our experiences. So we split up. Now, I was with Tall Jess, who's one of the co-creators of Morton's List, and also Brad. And we separated off and we, we started with exploring one of the hospital buildings. Now. Entering this building in the dead of night with nothing but flashlights uh, was an experience that's almost impossible to describe. I mean, the only the only kind of the only kind of safety net that we had was the fact that we were with people. You know what I'm saying? But we entered this building, and a lot of times we kept hearing noises. So we oh, shh, you know, just stop. And we'd sit and listen and be quiet. And you just hear all these noises, like you could swear in the background, you could hear like voices talking, people walking. The building, of course, was shifting in the wind, creaking, even groaning. And it was hard not to let your imagination just start running wild, you know. And so then, as, as long as we didn't hear anything real close to us, we, would kept go we kept going, we kept moving through the building. But every once in a while, you'd hear this loud boom, like this loud bang, you know what I mean? But it was almost like a thud, like real close. Like, there's it, just no way to describe it. And then we'd stop and we'd all be looking at each other in terror, our flashlights moving around, you know, what the fuck was that, you know? So. We got to this one room in particular that uh, it was on the third floor of one of the hospital buildings and we entered it, it was, a it was a corner room and the door was shut. So we opened it and inside this room was completely abandoned. All the paint was peeling, all chipped. In this particular room, none of the windows were broke. And when we left the room, we left the door open. So we were about halfway down this hallway when all of a sudden the door slammed shut. And we all stopped and we all looked at each other again all crazy and we looked back at the room and you know, your adrenaline's all flowing, your heart's beating a hundred a thousand times a minute and you're just like, you know, you're just looking around like terrified, like, oh shit, what do we do? So we went back there and we decided we had to confront our fears. So we went back there and we opened the door again. 
and we just looked at it and it was just sitting there and we, we like went into the room and we were like looking around to see if anything changed and nothing had. So we started leaving again and we got about halfway down the hallway. The door was still open when suddenly it slammed shut again. Ah! So we were like, oh shit, and we just started running. <laughs> like just the panic just overtook us and we were like, get the fuck out of here. And we just started running for our lives. So we like, we hauled ass all the way out the building and got outside. Uh, now, right, right about when we got outside, we started like, yelling for people, you know, hey, hey, come, you know, come here. And pretty soon everybody gathered to our location. And they're like, whoa, what's going on? And we're like, man, we started explaining it, the door slamming shut. Da, da, da. So then everybody was like, all right, fuck it. We got to go back there. You know, this is probably a haunted room or a haunted area. We got to take mad pictures. So we went back to that room and we sat in the room. First, we took a bunch of pictures, you know, then we tried the ghost writing, which is kind of like where you let your hand go limp and you start writing stuff in, in the hopes that like a ghost will like kind of possess your hand to start writing, to communicate. And, uh, Alex, uh, he started talking to the ghosts, you know, like we're, he was like, if there's a ghost here, uh, can you open the door? Because we had shut the door when we came in. After we got done, we left, you know, because like we were probably there for about a half hour and nothing was really happening. So we left and this time we shut the door, you know. So we were walking down the hallway and it was me, uh, Jesse and Brad were the last to leave. And we were about halfway down the hallway when the door suddenly opened like we heard the click as if somebody turned the the knob and we saw the door swing open you know we looked at each other we looked at the door and we just fucking ran because <laughs> you know I mean? like we, were, we didn't fucking know what to think at that point like it was it was the very thing that alex asked it to do you know to give us a sign because the whole time the door was shutting it was slamming shut and now here's this door opening you know so uh we basically took off and we caught up to everybody, you know, we frantically told them what happened. And everybody was pretty unanimous on not going back there. Okay, so then after that, like, we explored for a little bit more. Like, we were just coming in the random room, snapping pictures and all that. And then we finally survived the night. And as soon as daylight started coming up, we got the fuck out of there. Because the whole place just creeped us the fuck out. Now, here's the thing about this ghost hunting experience. When we got back... There was about like six different cameras that people were taking pictures with. And we developed the film, you know, and we listened to the tape recordings and the tape recordings had some really weird, like kind of like background shit going on, but nothing definitive, you know, like we didn't hear no voices on there or anything like that. Um, but when we developed the pictures, you know, we developed them all together and we took everybody's pictures and we, you know, we started sifting through it. And I don't know if you're familiar with ghost orbs, but there in the photos, there's ghost orbs everywhere. And all of them are hovering right next to people's heads. They're just chilling like right by their fucking heads. And sometimes in some of the pictures, there would be like four, like three or four ghost orbs all like hovering right next to their heads. And the thing that makes it to me, that makes it so remarkable is that's an all the photos from everybody's camera it's not like there's a glitch or something from one camera or whatever it's like in all the photos they're all the same the only other evidence of ghosts that we found was in one of the pictures that i developed it was just a random room and i just snapped a quick picture of that room later when i developed the film there floating in the window are 13 ghost orbs and the thing that's so amazing about the photo is some of those orbs are in front of the window and some are behind the window because the, the panes of glass, which creates a, a, a tic-tac-toe type pattern, uh, the orbs that are in front of the window. You can see the, they're transparent, so you can see the lines from the tic-tac-toe glass-shaped patterns behind it. But the ones that are outside the room, those tic-tac patterns basically stand in front of it. So it's quite clear that some of those orbs are in the room and some are outside that room, but they're clustered right there by that window. As if there's just like, for some reason in that room, there's just mad ghosts just chilling on that area. You know what I mean? So that fucking creeped me out. And that remains 
uh, one of my most prized possessions, that photo. Because to me, it's clear evidence of the supernatural world. Like, I don't even know how you could deny it. The Witch Haunt. Everybody emits a certain energy about them. Now, whether this stems from their spirit or their soul or whatever you want to call it, everybody has an energy that you can feel or that most people can feel. Like some people, they're not as attuned to others. Uh, for me, I always felt like I could I could tell a lot about a person just by being close to them. By being in proximity to them, I could kind of feel uh, what kind of energy they were emitting. Now, sometimes this energy is like, would make me uncomfortable. Like, you know, you ever meet somebody and the, the first time you know right away you don't even like them before they even say anything? You could just kind of get a sense for them that they're, uh, there's something wrong or, or foul about that person. And then sure enough, as soon as they start talking, you, you suddenly realize why you felt that way. It, it, it's apparent because yeah, they are, that person is off or that person is evil or that person is corrupted. Now, some people, they even have the ability to see auras. Now, I've never been able to see an aura, but when they look at a person, they can kind of see certain colors that that only that they can perceive, you know, with their psychic abilities or whatever you want to call it. Now, throughout my life, I've only encountered maybe two times that I've sensed something in somebody so evil that it actually it made me afraid. One time that this happened was when I was just driving down the road. Now, normally when I sense somebody's aura, you know, I have to be, it has to be like several feet away. Like I have to be close to the person, uh, at least in the same room with the person. Anyway, we were driving down this road this one day. I was with a group of my friends. I was in the passenger seat when there was this feeling of immense evil coming from this car in front of us, probably in front of us about like 30 feet, and it was in the right lane. And I was just drawn to it, like I looked at it, and I was like, whoa, what the fuck? You know, it was just emanating this intense evil and corruption. You know, and as we started getting closer to it, like I didn't know what to tell my friends because I didn't want to freak them out or whatever, like I'm crazy. But it intensified as I got closer to this car because it was slowing down in the right hand lane and we were catching up to it. So finally, I was like, I just said it, man. I was like, man, there's something fucking crazy evil in that car right there. I was like, just keep going, man. Just keep going. Like, don't slow down. You know what I mean? So as we passed it, I couldn't help but look over and it was just the old man, like from the from the outside. You know, if somebody was looking at him, he just looked like a normal person. But to to me, like I, I could perceive and feel this like evil just emanating from him. And it was then that I realized that not only are there corrupt souls on this planet, but I believe that there's demons as well, or perhaps people that are so corrupted in their spirit that they have manifested into demons or are host to demons. Now this one time, I had a direct contact with an actual demon, and I'll never forget it. And it was, it was the most horrifying moment in my entire life, like my most horrifying moment that I've ever experienced. So I was laying in bed one night sleeping, and I was probably about 14 years old or so, maybe 15. And I woke with my face in the, in the pillow. Okay, so I was suffocating. Like, that's how I woke up. Like, I woke up cause I, probably because I was dying. And, um, and when I woke up, not only was I suffocating, but I was completely and utterly paralyzed. I could not move. So I was laying there, face down, 
suffocating. And that was not the most horrifying feeling that I was having, the fact that I was suffocating or paralyzed. It was the fact that I felt this presence that was in the room. It was behind me and off to the right, something standing there right beside my bed. And even though I couldn't see it, I clearly felt it and knew it was there. And it was causing me this paralysis. It was causing this to happen. Like it completely had dominion over my body, my physical body, and I could not move. And all I could think about was getting away from this being, this entity that was there in the room. All I wanted to do was get away from that. And the fact that I was dying was secondary to the fact that I wanted to get outside of the presence of this evil force that was there in the room. So my mind was completely in panic. I was completely and utterly terrified. I could barely think, but somehow in all the anarchy of all the emotions that were flooding through me and the complete terror, I realized that if I could just move one of my fingers, if I could just concentrate and focus on one of the fingers of my body and move that one finger, then somehow I knew that that would allow me to somehow escape. And so I concentrated all my efforts and I was screaming in my mind, you know what I mean? Like I was fucking completely panicked, but somehow I was able to concentrate enough to move one finger. And then as soon as I moved that one finger, I was actually tapping in along the side of my bed. All of a sudden I could move my entire arm. And the next thing I know, I just sprung out of bed. And when I sprung out of bed, I fucking ran out of that room, you know, as fast as I could. And, and I don't remember much what happened after that. I just remember I wouldn't go back into that room for like weeks, you know? I was completely terrified that that was gonna happen again. Now, fast forward a couple of years, you know, I, I'm actually, you know, went through basic training in AIT. And, you know, we're going through our advanced individual training. Now, there was this guy in our unit, and I remember his name. His name was Cottrell. Cottrell was the only other time that I can remember sensing a demonic form in an actual person. Okay? This guy, he, he looked like, he almost had like frog-like features. Like his face, his, his, uh, his mouth was so wide. Uh, it, it was almost like lizard-like or something and he moved so slow it, it, it was weird like it wasn't just the the fact that he, he he had a sense of evil he had a look about him too that was just something was off about him anyway i sensed this evil in him you know it just really made me uncomfortable like just being around him it was like this it, it wasn't as strong as the uh the man in the car it wasn't as strong as that but it, and it definitely wasn't as strong as the entity that was in my room but it was definitely something that made me uncomfortable and i and i, I tried to avoid him anyway when we were going through our advanced individual training we had an instructor his name was sergeant todd now this guy this this instructor was a waste you know he didn't do anything he did all he did was sat he didn't try to teach us nothing he was just like look do whatever the fuck you want to do you guys are all passing this is what the guy told us do whatever you want to do you guys are all passing you know just uh you know i'm gonna be sitting here chilling so Cottrell decided that he wanted to collect money to get sergeant todd a plaque to you know reward him for like his teaching us or whatever and so he was collecting money from everybody and i said no nah, man I ain't, I ain't contributing to that fuck that you know and so he looked at me and he was like what do you mean you're not contributing i was like why would i give money for a plaque for someone that just sat on their ass the whole time they didn't teach me shit he was like you you for real you're not going to give money you know he started getting like like he was trying to boss up i said yeah man i'm not giving no money that's it that's fine and i walked off all right now, in the, the day room where we slept, and, you know, it was a giant room, like 50 people in there, bunk beds, all that. There was this group that went around at night and they were called the, uh, they were calling themselves the, uh, the Rat Pack. So if somebody had a problem with them or they considered somebody to be trouble, they would catch them in the middle of the night and beat them with these bars of soap, right? And, uh, you know, no, nobody was ever like seriously fucked up, but you know, it'd fuck you up a little bit. You know, people would be all bruised up the next day and fucking pissed off and whatever else, right? So anyway, 
I'm going to sleep one night and all of a sudden the rat pack is completely surrounding my bunk. Now I slept on the top bunk and I look down and there's Cottrell standing in front of them and there was probably about like 12 of them and he's like, yeah, that's the one. He's the one that said the rat pack ain't shit. He's the one. So all of a sudden, the leader of the Rat Pack, I don't remember his name, but he came up to me and he was like, he was like, you talking shit about the Rat Pack? So I jumped down off my bunk, right? Now I've been in these situations before where you're completely outnumbered and it's always the same effect. Like something happens to me where I suddenly lose all fear. Like when I realize that there's no possible chance of me winning a situation like in a physical confrontation like that, it always happens like I just lose entire fear. It just totally evaporates like I already know I'm gonna fucking get my ass beat so fuck it So I jumped down and I talked to the guy and I said hey man I was like no, I ain't I'm gonna tell you straight up. I don't have shit against the Rat Pack This motherfuckers pulling your strings. I have a beef with this motherfucker And I was like a truck if you want to go one-on-one -on -one, we'll go right now so he looked at me and he was all like fucking crazy, like upset and it just like eyes all fucking, you know, on fire and shit. So then all of a sudden he just like backed up in a slow motion was way and he fucking disappeared, right? So I was like, all right, straight. So anyway, some time passes. I complete AIT and I'm actually asleep in my bunk. Now I'm at St. Croix, the Virgin Islands. There was a hurricane that hit through there, Hurricane Hugo. And we were down there for a uh, hurricane relief effort, you know, in the army. And we're sleeping in these tents and they got the mosquito netting and all that. This was the second time that I experienced the, the paralyzation effect. This time I woke up, it was at night, and I was face up lying on my back. And I hear this noise. And I'm looking around and I'm completely terrified because I cannot move. You know, the same effect, just completely paralyzed, but I can move my eyes and I'm looking around and I hear this noise and suddenly I realize it's Cottrell. And he's coming up to my bunk and he's moving the curtains aside and he comes and stands over me and he's looking down at me and it sounds like he's hissing. It's the only way to describe it. It's like this real guttural kind of like almost like a hissing like sound. And he looks over me with his eyes and he's like looking at me and I realize that he's smiling. And I just sat there like completely paralyzed, wondering like what he's gonna do and he didn't do anything. He just stood back and he faded back and the next thing I know, I could move again, <laughs> all right? So when that happened, I jetted out of the fucking tent, you know what I mean? And that was it, you know, I didn't realize, like, I had no idea what it all meant. You know, I didn't confront him about it afterwards. I wasn't, like, afraid of him, but it was the second time that that happened, and it made me to believe he could have possibly been a demon himself. The thing with the, uh, the paralyzation is I did research on it later and I found out that I read the sleep book, this entire book about sleep, and there was a small paragraph in it that's about people waking up paralyzed with extreme anxiety. And it was just like one sentence, you know, and, and it said something about uh, it's a rare occurrence, but it happens to people all throughout the entire world. So then I read this other book and this book covered uh, supernatural phenomena and monsters and stuff like that. And in the very beginning of the book, there was this write-up by the author of the book talking about this phenomena. And he was using it as proof that supernatural horrors in this world exist. Because he was saying that this phenomena of people waking up paralyzed with extreme anxiety and you know, even feeling like a demonic force, like feeling as if there's a demonic force near them or in the room or even seeing things has been reported around the world since the beginning of recorded history. When I read that, 
there was like almost like a wash of relief because I felt like I wasn't the only one. Like this is something that, I don't know, it, it might not make sense, but just knowing that others have experienced this, you know, there's people that can relate to what I've been through and it brought me a great bit of relief. Also, he gave it a name. It was called the Witch Hunt. 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 The Road. The greatest adventure that I've ever been on involved a road, but not just any road, the road. Some of y'all have read about it in ICP's autobiography, Behind the Paint. Now this road, when we were growing up, it was the stuff of legend. Kids talked about it from as far back as I can remember. And there was rumors that abounded about the road. Some said there was an insane asylum on it. Others said that it was impossible to drive all the way through it and survive. And others, I remember one of the tales was this guy was driving down the road and he basically pretended his car broke down to spook his girlfriend. And then these uh, lunatics dragged him out of the car and killed him. Those were the kind of legends that as a child, they just sparked my interest to no end. And I vowed then and there that at some point I would encounter and defeat the road. As the years passed, I basically kind of forgot about it altogether until I was about 17 years old. One day my friend Matt Hapton came up to me and he was all crazy excited. He was like, Rob, you gotta check this out. Last night, we went down this crazy ass road, road, road. It had an insane asylum on it. It had a cemetery. It was fucking wicked as fuck. He was like, you gotta check it out. So I was like, oh hell no. And all of a sudden, all those stories came up from my childhood and I started remembering all the stories about the road. And I was like, could this be it? I was like, no way. So I was like, all right, check this out. We gotta go down there. It's time for a ninja mission. We're gonna walk that bitch. Walk that bitch. So we set the date, and of course, it couldn't be anything other than October 30th at midnight, Devil's Night. So we gathered the strongest warriors that we knew at the time from our crew, people that we knew would be a super asset to help us survive. So we gathered my brother Joe, right here, Joe Usler, yep, Steve Lindholm, what up, my boy Don Lichtel, Ta -da! Jim Symington, here, and Nate the motherfucking Matt. Yeah. Now we decided that we would each bring one weapon, you know, with us. So you know, people brought everything from a moose bone to bow and arrows. <laughs> you know what I mean, so we were like ready. Of course, I had the staff, which is my weapon of choice. We had about a month to prepare for the road. So the whole time we were in school, that's all we could fucking talk about. It was like whoever would listen to us, we were telling them about the road and what we were going to do, how we were going to freak it. And uh, finally, these two kids approached me and they were claiming that they had been to the road. And I was like, you know, I, at first I was skeptical, but then when they started describing it, there was way too many similarities. Like there was no doubt in my mind that they had been there. And they told me there was a monastery on the road full of monks. And the monks there, they don't like anybody to go there to fuck around. Anybody that comes around their property, they'll attack them. And they have shotguns that shoot rock salt. So they told us the story about him and his boy, you know, we're down there fucking around and they seen the monk monastery. So they pulled their truck over and got out and they started walking toward it to investigate. Suddenly they said they heard this whistling because the monks, they, they took a vow of silence so they, they can't talk, so they communicate by whistling. And they said they heard whistling and then shortly after that they heard the shattering of glass coming from their truck. So they ran back there to check it out and that's when they got blasted by rock salt from a shotgun by these monks and then they got beat the fuck down. So they were so enraged they said that man they were like super pissed off and they 
continue the story they actually went back found one of the uh the monk's vehicles and trashed it and flipped it and all this other shit anyway we were like man we were like that only intensified the situation you know most logical people would be like oh fuck that i ain't gonna fuck with that we were like oh that's awesome awesome <laughs> you, know I mean? awesome, you tell awesome, me there's fucking awesome. these evil monks like patrolling the road and shit we were like man that just made it all the hyper it was like living up to the legend you know so anyway it finally came to devil's night and we all piled up in the 69 oldsmobile this big ass fucking car with a v8 rocket engine and we rode down there to the mouth of the road now when we got there we pulled up we pulled into the woods and we camouflaged the car we basically took all this foliage and we piled it on on top of the car so that you know nobody could see it or find the car and then we stood there at the mouth of the road now all of us were totally camouflaged the fuck out even the face paint and we all had weapons and we were in full ninja mode and the adrenaline was just surging. It was midnight and it was completely dark and we're just looking down at this long ass fucking tunnel that's before us just immense in darkness and the wind is shifting and you hear like loons in the fucking woods and these weird animals and shit. And you know, being from the city, we're not used to that. So we're looking around like, oh shit, <laughs> you know what I mean? And, uh, but we were ready. We were fucking more than ready. I think. I think our whole lives we were ready for this moment. So we started walking into the woods. Now the first thing that happened to us on the road was we heard a CB going off. So when we heard the CB crackling, you know what I mean? Like maybe there's like a lookout or a caretaker, uh, you know, basically watching the road for like people like us that are out there like fucking around. So we ran into the cemetery and I remember like, the first thing I did was like we all kind of slid behind gravestones and we sat there and we were like completely still and silent. And we looked around and we were like, all right, look, check this out. I was telling everybody, we're just going to wait here. We're going to wait here until we see if the cops come or whatever. And we're not going to fucking move because we were like way deep in the cemetery. And I couldn't help but look over at the tomb uh, there was the uh, the catacombs that was sitting in the middle of the cemetery. It's this big foreboding building. And I remember the story my ma told me about uh, how she used to go there as a kid and knock on that door. And, uh, you know, there, it was rumored they wouldn't survive if they did that. Anyway, probably about 10 minutes passed, but it seemed like three hours as we sat there waiting. And nothing happened. No car came, no nothing. So finally we were like, all right, come on, let's go. Now walking the road is much, much different than driving it. It's, uh, it, you just feel unsafe. You feel exposed to all the elements and like anything can happen at any time. And the woods are so dense and so dark that it, it, it's as if like, if somebody was hiding in the woods, they could just reach your arm out and grab you. You're like you would never see them coming. So the whole time you're like looking constantly back and forth, you know, over your shoulder, like expecting anything to jump out at you at any time. So you like, needless to say, we were gripping our weapons super tight, like white knuckle tight as we proceeded forth because we are super cautious. Now, the next thing that we came upon was the insane asylum. It was actually lit up. There was lights shining at various points throughout the woods like they were probably about let's say 50 feet apart and so there was this fence that ran along the road on the left side that housed the Asain of Solemn grounds and then on the other side of that fence were all these lights just in the middle of fucking woods you know so we came upon this conclusion I don't know if it was justified or not that it was probably an insane lunatic had escaped <laughs> you know what I mean and that's why they had it lit up because they were looking for his ass. So that compiled with all the rumors from the past got us really amped up so we quickened our pace to get past the insane asylum, expecting any moment for an insane lunatic to jump out at us. We crossed past the insane asylum. Luckily, nothing happened. So then the next thing we saw was a, what can only be described as an old ancient World War II bunker. It was shaped like curved, like a big curved building. And it must have been 
a part of a farmland because there was a barbed wire fence that ran in front of it and bales of hay stacked up on the side of it, like a big hay pile. But it was so dark, we couldn't see any houses or a farmhouse or anything. It was just this old ancient uh, building, the structure. So I said, look, I'm gonna check it out. You know, I told everybody, I'm gonna check it out. They're like, all right. So I hopped over the fence and I started walking toward it. And that's when something huge moved in the darkness. And I looked up, I was like, my mind started flipping because I couldn't understand what I was seeing, but it was this giant form suddenly moved to face me and I'd seen its eyes glistening in the darkness. And it was huge. So I looked at it and then my mind started registering what it was and I screamed out, Bo! as loud as I could because all I saw was these fucking horns. So I thought the thing was about to charge me. It was this giant fucking beast in the, in the middle of the woods in the darkness, <laughs> you know, just in this, like, by this building. And I thought it was about to rush me, so I started running. And I flipped over the fence, like, I don't, I don't even know how I did it. It was like a ninja flip. Like, my adrenaline was going so fast, I was just like, pa, and I was over that fence. Anyway, we started looking to try to see what the fuck it was, and it ended up it was a fucking cow. Now, I didn't know this, but, you know, being from the city and stuff, but, like, some cows have, like, these small horns on their head, you know? So once I determined it was safe, I kind of went over the fence again, and then the cow was, like, moving slowly away from me. That's when I started hearing all the, the moo sounds coming from all the cows that were packed in the infantry style building that they're in. So I got real close to it and looked in and it looked like there was like a hundred of these cows just all packed in there. I mean, maybe that's an exaggeration, but there was a lot of fucking cows just packed in there. So I went back to my crew and I said, look, test the bravery. If we're gonna survive the road, if we're gonna be able to, to continue this mission, we have to fucking test ourselves right now. We each have to walk through that barn. So they were like, all right, bet. <laughs> so we all hopped the fence. We went up to the fucking, the, the structure, and we started to slowly walk through in the dark, packed with cows. Now, it's no easy task because like, as we were moving through, we started disturbing the cows and they all started like moving around and try to get out the building. So as we're like walking, you're just getting, you're kind of getting battered by these giant bodies that are moving in the complete darkness and we didn't have no light. That's another thing I wanted to mention. The whole time of the road, it was a strictly no light policy. We didn't have flashlights, we didn't have nothing. We were in straight up ninja mode. Like we didn't want to give ourselves away. So we're like walking through this barn and these cows are shifting and we're like sinking in shit and mud. And uh, it, it was just, it was crazy. So finally, the cows all strung out into the field and we were like, they were mooing like real fucking loud, causing a big commotion. And uh, you know, and basically spanning out, like try to imagine like a hundred cows all fanning out into the field and they're all mooing and, and you know, just like getting li as live as cows can get. Suddenly we seen this light come on from a far distance. When the light came out, we could see the porch and out of the porch, we see this door open and this man steps out onto the porch uh, with a shotgun. We were like, oh fuck, let's get the fuck out of here. And we all start running. And we were like, come on, we gotta get over the fence. Now in the darkness running, um, I didn't see the barbed wire. Like I couldn't gauge where exactly it was at and I ran smack into that bitch. And I caught one of the barbs like right between my eyes, like just at the apex of my nose. I, and, it just bam, like I saw like this sharp, like white light for a second. And next thing I know, there was blood dripping down my nose in, in my face. Uh, and I saw like one of my other boys, he started up the, the pile of hay and all of a sudden he just sunk right in the middle of the hay. Boom, he just disappeared. <laughs> you know, just like a soft spot in the top of the hay and he was just disappeared. So at this time, everybody's kind of like panicking. And uh, eventually we made it all over the barbed wire fence and we, you know, we ran down the road for quite a bit. We finally got off to the side of the road and we started catching our breath. And at that point, people wanted to go back. They were like, man, fuck this, you know, this is too much, you know? So I remember it was at that moment where 
my brother stepped up and he basically gave this really elaborate speech, you know, like a super motivational speech. You know, no, you know, this is our time. Why are we, why are we going to go back now? We have to fucking school this and survive this. And, and you know, you knew there was going to be dangers. You know, what, what did you think? This is going to be easy? This is what a test of a ninja is all about. Surviving this road, like right now, right here. You know what I mean? Yo, you're just going to go back and, and fail? And he was just like, fuck that. And he was just getting all worked up. So when he gave that speech, everybody kind of like, it kind of inspired everybody again, you know? Like my brother was always real good at that, like hyping people up, like, you know what I mean? So, you know, of course I stood by him, you know what I mean? They're like, man, you're all fucked up. You're, you're bleeding from your nose and shit. And I was like, man, this ain't shit. You know, there was no way, no question. There's no way I was going back. So we continued further down the road. We traveled about a, about a mile or so more down the road. And we were coming across this bend in the road, and that's when we heard it. It started really far away off in the distance, almost like outside of your hearing range. And it sounded almost ghostly, and it was a whistle. And when we heard that, we all stopped. And in the back of our minds, we're like, did we just hear that? And then all of a sudden closer, like that whistle was like, like off to the left. And all of a sudden off to the right and closer, we heard a repeat whistle. And when we heard that, I swear to you, the blood in my body just froze. And it was at that moment when I realized all the rumors about the road were true. To me, everything that was spoken was true. And we were being hunted. That's what I realized next. That those whistles, and they kept repeating on each side of us from all angles, were the monks in the road and they knew we were there and they were actively hunting us. So I remember I looked at Don and I was like, you know, my mind, like being a role player, like sometimes I can shut off fear and like think, I can kind of step outside of myself. And I looked at Don and I said, I said, Don, man, repeat that whistle, you know, so they think we're one of them, <laughs> you know what I mean? And so, Don went up there and he did some kind of bullshit whistle. It sounded nothing like, nothing like what they were doing. And so when he did that whistle, all the whistling stopped and there was complete silence save for our heavy breathing in the crickets. I told everybody, man, get your fucking weapons ready. You know, this is it. You know what I mean? We were ready. We felt like they were going to come busting out of the woods at any second. So we started to pick up our pace, you know what I mean? Moving down the road and, and that turned into like a jog. We started running. You know, I just gripped my staff extra tight and we're running down this road, you know what I'm saying? And looking around and, and just like, there's nothing though, no whistling, no nothing, just silence. So we ran, I'm not even sure how long it was, maybe like five or 10 minutes when we finally started slowing down. And when we looked behind us, all we saw was a wall of darkness and we didn't hear any whistling. So we stopped and we were like, be quiet, be quiet, be quiet. And we just really listened as close as we can. Now it was at this time, as we stood there on the side of the road listening, that I looked over and through the trees, I saw a light emanating. So I looked at my boys and I was like, that's it. That's the fucking monk monastery. It's in the same area, like straight up. We're right on top of the monk monastery. We left the road and we started cutting through the woods and we came upon a barbed wire fence. So we hopped that, went about 10 more feet, another barbed wire fence. So we all hopped that and we kept going real quiet as we possibly could be. And when we got close to the woods edge, we all dropped down and started low crawling all the way up to the edge of the woods. And we looked down. 
Now, the monk monastery, the stone building with the jagged edges, the jagged rooftops was all lit up. And there was a clearing, like they had cut all the trees around it for about a hundred feet in all directions. And it was in the middle of this field that kind of bowled down. So the monastery was at the, the base of this bowl type effect, like the land sloped down toward the middle. It's kind of as if a big meteor hit there and left a big crater. But that's kind of how it was, but it was like grass. And it sloped down and there in the middle was this stone monastery, huge. And the tops of it were jagged points and it had vines growing up the sides of it. And there was a giant gigantic window. It looked like a giant church window in front of it. And there was a little shed along the side of it. And so we looked down at this monk monastery and as we watched, we can see through the giant picturesque window, there was a, some sort of ceremony going on. There was a monk in a brown robe and there was a man in front of the window. And the man was standing there with his head bowed as the monk looked like he was blessing him. And the man was just dressed in normal clothes like jeans and a t-shirt. You know, but he was like kind of bowing there and the monk wearing the full-on cowl with the hood was like blessing him. So we were like in awe as we watched this and clearly they, they couldn't tell we were out there. I mean, we were like far away from where that was happening. The only reason we could see it is because inside the window were like hundreds of candles. They're all lit. So we stood there and watched it for a while. And then finally the monk and the man left. And I told everybody, I said, test the bravery. And they were like looking at me like, oh shit, not again. And I was like, look, everybody's got to go down and we got to at least touch the monastery. Like if we don't do this, we're fucking straight up bitches. I was like, you got to do it. So they were like, all right, bet. So I started down the hill and I low crawled all the way down that bitch. Now this is even before I joined the army. But I'm going to tell you what, man, I was like the best low crawl you ever seen. You know, stay low to the ground and it was sloped down. So it was pretty easy actually to slide down the hill. And I got all the way down to where the shed was. And I stopped and I looked and I was listening to see if anybody was in there. And I didn't hear anything. So I kept low crawling all the way up to the building and I touched it. And then I started hightailing it back. Now, as I was going up, I saw everybody else coming down. Like when they seen like I had made it safely, everything was good. They all started running down, like not, not even trying to fucking front or low crawl or anything. And they just went all the way down to the base of the, the monastery. And I came back up to where close to where the barbed wire fence was in the same position. And I got down and I was watching them. Now, these motherfuckers, man, they were running all the way around that bitch, looking in the windows and you know, just like, like no fucking care at all. You know what I mean? I was like, oh shit, you know, what the fuck are they doing? So then after about a couple minutes of that, like just kind of like everybody going crazy, losing their mind, everybody started running back up. So when they got back to my location, they all kind of plopped down, they were out of breath and everything. I was like, whoa, what's going on, man? What are you guys doing? And everybody had a story. They're like, oh man, it's fucking crazy. I fucking looked in. I think it was Don. He was like, I looked in, I seen this fucking monk. He was walking down the fucking hallway, butt ass naked. I was like, get the fuck out of here. He's like, yeah, man, he had no clothes, just walking down the hallway. And then another guy was telling me, he looked in his window and there was a bedroom and there was a monk praying on the edge of the bed naked. So we were like, get the fuck out of here, man. What are you talking about? And it was like, yeah, and everybody had all these stories, like monks walking with the, the, the brown robes on, the whole nine. So we were like, all right, man, let's get the fuck out of here. You know what I mean? So we started crossing. We crossed the one barbed wire fence. We crossed the second barbed wire fence. We got back to the road. We started walking, like, quickly. We were feeling a little bit better because we went all the way around that monastery. Like, it wasn't shit, and we didn't get attacked. Nothing happened. We hadn't heard the whistling you know, in a long time now. So we're like, all right, we're fucking good. So we start crossing down the road and all of a sudden, 
we start hearing these fucking shots. And we and as we hear the shots, you just hear like these pellets is the only way you can explain. Like these pellets ripping through the dense wood, like uh, popping off of tree trunks and, and and splintering small branches and cutting through the leaves and shit. Like it's just it, it was weird. Like it had this fucking crazy weird sound, and it sounded like it was coming from all around us. We just heard this popping and these shotguns going off. So as we as we heard that. I looked back and I said, run, run, as loud as I could, fucking run. And we started hauling ass because we couldn't even tell where it was coming from. And we just all started running as fast as we could, just like straight down the road, like the same direction we were headed, you know, just run it. Now, as I ran, there was a small path that crossed across the road. It was like a, I guess a four way intersection. And as I ran past that, I looked off to my left as I was running. Now this path, this small path went down a ways, like maybe about 50 feet, and it opened into this clearing. And in the clearing, I saw about four or five pickup trucks in a circle on the edge of the clearing. And there standing in the middle of the clearing were these monks. A group of monks, all dark in the, you know, really dark in the darkness, like almost like silhouettes. And they're pointing guns at us as we're passing by and shooting. So the reality of that, that image of them standing there in the clearing, that will forever remain in my mind. Like, I will never forget that. It, it was it was one of the one of the scariest moments of my life, and you know it just felt like we weren't gonna make it. <laughs> you know what I mean, I, I really felt like at that moment that it was we were done, and so we kept running, and and my boy Steve Lindholm got hit in the leg, and he started screaming. Ah! He, I guess his momentum, his, uh, the adrenaline was flowing so hard that he just kept fucking running. And we were trying to help him. We were like, come on, come on. And he was all in pain, and we just kept running. So we ran and we ran until we were almost out of breath, like completely exhausted. And that's when somebody yelled, car! And we looked back, and sure enough, coming down the road from the same direction we were running from, we saw a set of headlights that were coming at us. So we all ditched to the right side of the road, and we got deep into the woods, and we dropped down. And we were trying to be as still as we possibly could, even though we were all breathing heavy. And then I was looking, and sure enough, here come the pickup trucks. The same ones that were in the field, slowly creeping down the road as if they were looking for us. And as they passed one by one, you can see in the back window there were gun racks where their shotguns were nestled. And their rifles were like nestled onto these racks in the back windows of the cab of these pickup trucks. Now the amazing thing was right at this moment, I look over and there's Don Lichtel standing up, notching an arrow into his bow as he's watching these pickup trucks slowly pass by. Now, one thing I got, I, I wanna tell you about Don Lichtel, like I've seen this dude stand up, he's, a, he's, he's an Hawaiian dude, he stands about five foot six feet tall, and I've seen him stand up against muscular six foot four ninjas in high school like talking mad shit like ready to fight him uh so he was standing there with this bow and arrow and he's slowly pulling the bow back and there at the tail end of the convoy of pickup trucks is one pickup truck that is just tailing behind and it's a big gap between the rest of the convoy and them it's moving slower than the rest of the trucks so we're all standing there watching Don in awe when suddenly he comes right up to the side of the road and unleashes the arrow, almost at point blank range. Next thing we saw was the window just shatter as the arrow goes through and embeds itself into the passenger seat, narrowly missing the monk that was sitting there. The, the driver throws up his hands in panic and the next thing we saw was the pickup truck swerve off to the side of the road and bam, hit a tree and come to a stop. Now when that happened, there was a few moments where we're all kind of looking at each other. We're looking at the pickup truck and all of a sudden this rage just overtook us. 
and we all got up almost at once and we started rushing the truck. Now, by the time we gained our wits and started rushing the truck, they, would al- they had already opened the, the, the driver and the passenger door and they started running through the woods. So we gave chase. Now, I didn't make it very far. We kind of split up because the two mugs ran in two different directions. And one group was following the one guy. I was following the other guy. Next thing I know, I entered the woods and I probably only made it like like maybe like five or ten feet when all of a sudden this branch just caught my eye, just like poked me right in the eye. So I, I was all in this pain. I kept running for a little while longer and bam, I hit a bush or some shit, some underbrush. And it just totally knocked me off my feet. So as I lay there in pain, I'm like hearing this echoing of these voices deep in the woods. I hear my brother and my friends cursing out these monks and I hear him shouting like, oh, he's over here, come on, and just, just shouts echoing through the woods, just mad chaos. So anyway, I found out later that they gave chase for a while, but, but nobody ever caught them. And it was kind of lucky that that branch caught my eye because if I would have been running after them, I probably would have caught them because I was basically the best runner we had. And in a way, I'm, I'm really happy that, that I didn't catch them. You know, because if we would have caught them, it would have been real bad. So after the monks got away, we regrouped back onto the road and we continued down the road for a few more miles. As we came to the end of the road, we started to see sparse houses start to appear and we started to feel a sense of joy and safety as we emerged once again back into civilization. We had made it. We had survived and conquered the road. We traveled for a ways until we finally found a payphone where we called our boy to come pick us up, who took us back to our car. When we got there, we removed the camouflage to find a note was tucked underneath the windshield wiper. When we read it, it simply said, if we would have found you, we would have killed you. We assumed, of course, that it was from the monks. It was their last message left to us, warning us to never come back. But we had survived, so it didn't matter at that point, because we went home with a notch in our belt that we had completed our ninja mission, the greatest ninja mission. And that was a moment that will forever remain in my mind as the greatest adventure that I believe I've ever been on and probably will ever be on in my life.